Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hey, everybody, Adam Olette from Leave the Law Pod- Love or Leave the Law podcast. I'm here with Greg McLawson today. I am so excited to talk with Greg today because he is one of the only attorneys that I've ever met that have, has set up his law firm to practically run without him. And so one of the things I've been touting over the months that we've done this podcast is you can automate so much in your practice and you can outsource stuff in your practice. And so Greg is going to be here to tell us a little bit of the outcomes that he had in doing this with his own firm. He calls it re-engineering. And I love that word. He re-engineered his firm from the ground up. And let me just tell you a little bit about him. And then we're going to have him expand about that on this. Um, he is the founder of Sound Immigration. He works behind the scenes to ensure the firm's clients have a outstanding experience. He's passionate about reinventing the practice of law to make it work better for those that he serves. So Greg, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Adam. Tell us a little bit about your practice first and foremost. Yeah, so there, I guess there are a couple of them now. The main one is Sound Immigration. We're a web-based immigration law firm that serves primarily family-based immigration clients all over the world. And we work primarily through um, remote means with these clients. So we do have clients here in Washington state, but a fair number of our uh, clients never see us in person and they connect with us either from somewhere else in the United States or a different country. That's really cool. What, so that, that's your main practice. And you have, I think when we talked a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago, you have what five attorneys working for you now? Yeah, it's a five attorney law firm and it's completely decentralized, meaning that our five attorneys are in different offices across the state of Washington. I love that too. So do they work from home or do they work in, in an office or tell me a little bit about how you have that set up? They all, they all do have offices. Um, they are different arrangements. So some, some attorneys work primarily in a traditional office setting and others because of their own work habits prefer to work from home, just like I do. Yeah. I mean, it's in 2005, I started working from home and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And, you know, I've always had an office and continue to have an office in Florida. Uh, but when I started working from home, people said, how do you do that? How do you not watch TV all day long? It's because I can go in my office at home and shut the door and it's like I'm in a different world. And so the other thing that helps me when I'm not in an office where you have a setting where you have paralegals and secretaries and, and partners and all that is nobody's knocking on my door every five minutes, you know, and that to me, there was so many interruptions and there's so many interruptions in our lives today. Like texting is just a constant interruption for all of us. And so when I got rid of that and I said, I'm going to close the door, I'm turning my phone off. I'm going to spend three or four hours a day just working. And then I'll check my email after that. I was able to get so much more done. And so for you decentralizing, and I'm sure that's been a pretty good thing because then, then you don't have a, a massive office that you're paying for with a ton of overhead. Yeah, that's right. Um, we do have one uh, full-time office down in Tacoma, Washington, okay. but most of our office is on demand. So nice. we just pay for what nice. we use. So tell me a little bit about why you went to law school. We always cover that in a lot of these episodes. And we're, Casey and I are interested in, in asking people, what was one of the reasons or a few of the reasons why you ended up going to law school? Yeah, for all the wrong reasons from a business standpoint. Um, and I went into immigration law for all the wrong reasons from a business standpoint. I, I started my first legal work as an undergraduate volunteering for the public defender's office and uh, basically drank the Kool-Aid um, and, and proud to have drank the Kool-Aid. Nice. And, and really did and still do believe in big picture social justice issues. I was a philosophy student at the time mm. and really spent a lot of time thinking about um, ways in which uh, the profession can make the world a better place. And I still very much believe in that and went off to law school thinking I'd work in the public defender's office or for a social justice nonprofit. And um, I think I've tried to carry through on, on that ethos even here in private practice. Well, one of the things that you're doing, you, you created a, a website, Airport, Airport Lawyer. Is that what it is? Yeah. So this was just a super tiny um, side project. I do a lot of work in um, kind of technology and innovation at the law firm. And in the current uh, political environment, probably folks know, I don't know when this podcast will go live, but we had a series of two travel bans imposed by the Trump administration, the first of which left a lot of travelers um, 
kind of in the lurch. So we had seven countries whose citizens were banned from coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. People were being turned away at the airport, even with valid visas. And so a massive, massive army of lawyers mobilized around the country. The problem was that they didn't know which travelers they needed to help. Uh-huh. So we created a secure web-based app for travelers to be able to submit their information and connect with these teams of volunteer lawyers. And we launched that in about 48 hours over a weekend with the help of Neota Logic in New York, which mm-hmm. is a technology firm serving attorneys. And uh, it was a... A tremendous success, huge, huge success. <laughs> huge, huge. No, I, I want uh, the lady that introduced us when she put uh, the information in and it said airport, it was right around the time of the first travel ban. And I was like, man, this guy is really on it. And so when you're talking social justice, you're on the forefront of it. And part of the reason why people go to law school is to help the greater good. And, and, and so I give you kudos on that because a lot of people go to law school because they want to make a good living. And so and it's not, and it's not a zero sum game. I, I believe very much that some of the most successful law firms are also the ones that are doing the most effective and important client work. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And so one of the things that I, I really liked about seeing that ability for lawyers like you did is just, Hey, there is a need here. I'm going to fill this need. Now I'm going to get the pieces of the, uh, the, the, and the tools together and I'm going to create this website to help people because ultimately when you look at these travel bans, uh, they're not doing what they, they say they're doing. They're, they're a way to keep people out of the country that have every right to be here. And so, um, this is the, th- you know, this is what we talk about in this podcast. And this is what I, I teach about is, you know what, there is a different aspect of the practice of law where that is all you do is help people. And there's nothing wrong with making great living. And so when you can couple those things together and you utilize technology and you utilize the ability to uh, help as many people as you can, and you're doing it all over the world. So it's amazing what you're doing. You know, and I think there's a lot of really good intention in our field of attorneys who, who do genuinely want to do good client work. What I've discovered um, in the small practice community, which I've been very involved in, is that it's awfully hard to to be the person doing the client work and also be the person who's thinking critically about how you actually improve the service that you're delivering to a client. Because just sitting around and trying to do a good job absolutely doesn't cut it. And you need to be doing something more deliberate and systemic if you actually want to improve your firm. I realized early on, you know, 20 years in now, I, I, I look back and I said, you know, two years in, I, I could see most of what I was doing was working in the business of law and in, in the practice. And I wanted to work on it. And that's the, the differentiation. There are people that are really good working in it and do, dealing with the clients and going to court and all that. And about five years in, I said, I just, I want to work on it. I want to network. I want to grow the business. I want to look at the new technologies that are out there and how we can utilize automation and all that. And so it is difficult when you're the, a solo to be able to figure out how do I get enough time to work on it, on the practice and, and grow it and, and do what you've done. How are you able to, to, let's talk about that re-engineering process that you did. Tell me where you were at when you first started thinking about, you know what, I need to look at this a little bit deeper and walk us through the first couple steps of, of how that happened. Well, I would say that that actually drove my choice um, to get into private practice in the first place. I was just out of a clerkship here in Washington State. Um, that sounds fancy. It definitely wasn't. I was just working um, basically as an in-house attorney for a small trial court. It was a wonderful experience, um, mm. but it wasn't all. It wasn't a glamorous federal district court clerkship. Mm. And started it was experience. Working. That was good. It was, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, and started working um, for a pretty short time in a small practice um, in an immigration firm. And this, this was a wonderful, uh, very experienced, extremely well-regarded practitioner. But I felt like I saw a lot of opportunities to really improve the client experience, improve efficiencies and effectiveness in the firm. And I guess I was drawn to that as kind of the project that I was interested in taking on, you know, as, as primarily thinking about the a law firm as a system and how all the cogs could be improved. Mm. And so from the beginning, that, that was kind of my, I had my eye on that as what I was interested in, in tackling. And, and simultaneously, 
and trying to do it in a way that would let me um, prioritize the personal things in my life that were very important to me, which include travel. Um, That's right. I had traveled extensively before law school and my wife and I decided pretty early into my private practice that we wanted to spend two to three months traveling every year. That wow. And, and, and you're doing that. Exactly. So when you're here at, you're at this firm and you're seeing the systems that these people have in place and you're saying, you know, I could do this better. Then you, you got to the point where you said, let me jump out onto my own and, and become uh, start my own law firm. How, how did that go? Were there any challenges in doing that? Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, right. I mean, anybody who's done this knows that there's no part that isn't challenging. That's right. Right. Yeah. Every, every bit of the process is painful. Getting your first client in the door is, is hard. Getting your hundredth and two hundredth client in the door um, isn't necessarily any easier. Mm. And there's no formula for that, for sure. So when you, when you left and went on your own, uh, what, what, what were the first things you started to do to, to try to generate some client interest in your firm and get people to hire you? Oh, wow. That was way back in the day. Um, you know, I think one thing that I would share just because it's something that after reflection, I, I think was probably <laughs> perhaps a bad choice was I, I spent a huge amount of time doing bar volunteering mm. and research and writing. Okay. So I, um, I went into the state bar association and ended up um, chairing the small practice section, which was one of the largest sections of the Washington bar. After a few years, mm. I wrote a bunch of law journal articles, spoke at many, many CLEs. And that certainly has paid dividends um, in the end. So now I speak several times a month and we put on CLEs for hundreds of attorneys every month at the law firm, probably none of which would be possible. Um, but for that early investment, gotcha. but in terms of um, actually bringing folks in the door in the short run, ooh, I would say that's a, it's a long game. You know, if, if you're trying to establish yourself as an authority, as a good speaker and as a, a you know, some form of legal scholar, that's a long game. And man, if you're looking at the five year horizon for a firm, I'm not sure I would encourage any of your <laughs> listeners to go that route. Yeah, I mean, it's a process. I, I was lucky enough to, to start into a, a firm that was a solo and when I, before I came, and he had somewhat of an established practice. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it wasn't like I was starting anew, but I did start from the get-go, and he wasn't doing any networking at all. I mean, it was, he was practicing door law, whatever walked in the door right. he got, and he was 25 years in. So he did have somewhat of a client base, but I'm like, there's just not enough clients here. So I, I said, let me get out and network. And so part of the problem and we in Casey and I did are doing some videos now for the podcast on networking that will have aired by the time this comes out. But one of the things that most people think when they start networking or connecting with other people is that it's an instantaneous thing. Oh, I'm just going to go out and hand my business cards out yeah. and business is going to flock in, but it is a process. And so if you're thinking about going out on your own or you're out already on out on your own, one of the things I can tell people is to get out of the office. If that's what you want to do is build the practice, get out of the office and start to create those relationships. And there is ways, amazing ways you can do that. Um, but it, it is a process and you found that exact same thing in your own firm. You know, and, and I don't know if I'm, I'm necessarily disagreeing with that or not. I think the the networking is certainly important in the long run with um, peers in the legal community. If I had to do it again, and I was really worried about just being, you know, cash flow positive in six months, I would, I would never write a law journal article. I would never give a CLE, wouldn't join any bar committees. And I would learn the hell out of Facebook marketing. That's right. Borrow money from mom if I had to. Yes. And, yes. and get a direct, super, super niched down um, Facebook campaign. Yes. And I mean, you could have people in the door in a couple of days with that. You can, especially in, in terms of what you do. Now, will it work for every kind of attorney? I think in the, in the, the short term, it probably will help. It just really depends on, because I've done Facebook ads for my real estate practice in terms of my, my law practice and my title companies, and it worked really well. I mean, I was able to capture leads, convert them, and we were getting, peop- we were getting uh, real estate brokers introducing us into their office and real estate agents that I had never met before never met. And it, it turned my networking over on its head because I had always been used to getting out and, and shaking hands and meeting people and creating relationship. 
and the way I did it was creating a relationship online by providing educational materials, mm -hmm. webinars and videos to these real estate agents where by the time they got through my playlist on YouTube, which I'm now monetizing, by the way, I've taken it all down and I'm going to charge for it because the stuff is good. I mean, it's really good. There's 70,000 views of for Florida realtors of these videos and I pat myself on the back, but it's good because of my experience and my ability to tell people, don't do this shit. Make sure you're aware of this and all that. It's, it's right. not about me. It's just about the, the crap and challenges that I've been through. But ultimately, Facebook ads can be amazing ways of, of getting business. And a lot of the people that join us on the podcast have come from Facebook and Facebook ads. And so mm -hmm. it is a, there's a learning curve there. Do you, you, you still run them? Oh, well, um, I, I have on and off. I was just using that as an example of, okay. You know, if you were starting new and yeah, it, to get person. things going. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Right. So when, go ahead. Do you have something? No, else no, no, go ahead. Okay. When you re-engineered this, so you're looking at your engineering, uh, your, your firm, you're looking at, I want to, I want to travel two to three months a year and you're going over to Asia. You're traveling all over the place, right? Yeah. So over, let's see my, left shoulder is a medal from the Bhutan marathon, which I, I, I wouldn't say I ran it, but I completed it a couple months ago. You participated, right? You got a participation medal like the yeah. kids do. No, but that's cool. That, that's great. But so you just, you just did that recently, didn't you? Yeah, I guess that was March. Uh, last, that's last so month. cool. So you're saying I want to travel and your, your wife and, and your little one go with you when you travel. I mean, so this is, is a family thing. You're, you're saying I want to travel two to three months a year. When you decided that, what did, what did it take in terms of flipping the, the normal law firm upside down to make that work? I mean, I think certainly the, the stickiest point is getting client contact right. Mm. You know, because even, even with our practice, which is essentially transactional in nature, there are still some documents that need a wet ink signature. Yeah. And on top of that, we still do have some clients who want the in-person contact and we want to be able to accommodate that. Sure. So that's, that's just not possible as long as I'm the guy who's wearing the hat that requires, you know, showing up at the office and putting pen to paper to sign the application form. So it required growing it to be at least big enough that there was another competent qualified attorney who could be there for the clients. And when you hired that first attorney, were they trained already or did you have to train them? Or tell me a little bit about that process. Um, so Gustavo was our first um, attorney. He was uh, basically just out of law school. Okay. Super qualified, brilliant, um, smart guy. Um, but it was his first um, experience. First job, job, right? Yeah. Which, you know, which can be a good thing because it's, it's good to grow up in the culture of the firm. Well, it's great if you're training them from the ground up because then you're training them on how you want it done and, and they're not bringing in external beliefs and ideas from someplace else that may not be aligned with how you want to do business or how you want customer contact to be and stuff like that. So, so you, brought, you brought in the first attorney. We know it's five now. How did you automate that, a lot of that customer client, uh, client contacts, not customers, clients? How did you automate that kind of stuff and what kind of processes did you go through to, to do that? So a lot of our work isn't so much automated as scaled in a way that doesn't require staff. Okay. So for example, um, like the easy stuff, you know, should be obvious to anybody who's thought about it. Phones, you know, we don't answer phones with staff that's outsourced right. to um, Ruby receptionist in Oregon plug for Ruby. They are phenomenal. Um, we don't do scheduling at the firm that's handled by a really good call center. Uh, they have a lot of locations. Ours is in Houston. So they have bilingual staff that do our appointment scheduling. Um, accounting is outsourced. So that skills as needed. Um, those are all relatively easy. Sure. One thing that we've done that's a little bit unique in the small practice community, I think we're the only small immigration firm in the country that does it, is that we offshore all of our paralegal work. Mm. Um, in our practice, it's pretty document heavy. So we might have, gosh, 30 pages of uh, mandatory government forms that have to be drafted in support of an application packet that might be eight to 12 hours per client case. And uh, we pay a firm that's uh, based in Bangalore to do mm -hmm. that. And 
Um, it's done in a very secure way. Actually, their data security protocols are way better than most law firms in the United, United States. United States law firms, yeah. And, and the quality is excellent. Mm. There can be a price advantage, but that's actually not most important to me. What's most right. important is the scalability. So we pay only for what we use. Mm. The quality is excellent. Um, I haven't, I can't think of a time in the last four months when an attorney has complained about errors on a form, which is great. Wow. And, um, and it's overnight, literally. So we can do, we can do literally overnight what most law firms struggle to do in a week. And you and I talked about the idea that you had of, of uh, maybe marketing something like that. And, and so if that is the case, by the time this episode airs, we <laughs> will put a link to you so that people can connect with you somehow, however you want that to be, whether it's online or whatever, if that is the possibility, because I love that idea. And, uh, you know, in terms of automating, you're outsourcing instead of automating. And that's uh, I love it. There's, there's, you don't need to have a secretary sitting there at, at 50,000 plus a year. You've got all this stuff where you're outsourcing it and you're only paying for what you're using, which makes a lot of sense. And um, th it, these are tips that most attorneys need to start looking for and, and using in their own firms. And let me mention something about that yeah. because, you know, especially for these forms, most attorneys think about it in terms of, you know, what computer software could do this, do the work for me. Right. The problem is kind of twofold. First of all, you have to adapt to their system. So if, yes. I, if I take on a form generating software, I have to learn how to use the software. I have right. to fill out forms using their tools. And it's never perfect. There's always time investment in going in and fixing problems in the form, et cetera. And that doesn't really solve my problem as, as an attorney. Mm -hmm. My problem is I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. I want to not waste my time dealing right. with work that doesn't require an, an attorney. So with, right. with the way we have it set it up, we send questionnaires to our clients. They give them back to us. We press a button and send them to the paralegals and they just magically reappear as work product. And it's totally hands off from my perspective. And even if I pay a premium over what I might've paid on a form generating software, it solves the problem for me in a way that, dinking around with the software program doesn't solve. Right. right. So no, I love for, it. So thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. I've, I just got the go ahead from the CEO of um, one of these offshoring companies on a partnership. So we're exploring whether other attorneys are interested in this. And that's a big well, question to me. I don't know what the, how receptive attorney, other attorneys are. Well, this is part of my mission, uh, Greg. My mission is to help figure out, help people figure out ideas to outsource or automate. And I love the automate part because we did a tremendous amount of automation. But the thing is, I still had to have someone sitting there that was overseeing a closing, uh, making sure that all that stuff was perfect. And you, clearly you have attorneys that are overseeing that as well. But in the end, when you're outsourcing, even your schedule, even if it's to like you use schedule once as I do, mm -hmm. outsourcing your personal schedule for your business to something like a, a time trade or a schedule once can save so much time and then you don't have to have a secretary setting those appointments and it syncs with your calendar or using the kind of outsourcing you're talking about where there's a call center, which is perfect for clients because a lot of times they want to talk to someone to set an appointment and they don't know that the, that person isn't sitting in an office that you own or, or rent. Or uh, care. <laughs> no, care and, 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 and they just want to set an appointment. And yeah. so I think this is a valid distinction today. And, and one of the uh, main points of today is you can outsource a lot of stuff. And that, that's exactly what you and I talked about in terms of the books that we both read, the E-Myth and then the four-hour work week. That's what those books advocate is automation and outsourcing. And E-Myth is a little bit dated now. And so there wasn't a lot of automation to be done back then. But ultimately, you know as well as I do, Greg, that E-Myth says anything you can have a non-attorney do legally, you get a non-attorney to do. And that's clearly what you've done. Yeah. And, and you can get it done better. You know, if when yes. I had a, a legal assistant for a while, um, who I thought I, you know, vetted and hired very carefully. And she just was bad. Yeah. You know, I, I invested a sick amount of time in yes. hiring process training. And then it was all for nothing after, you know, some, some mistakes on her part. Yeah. That's a problem, you know, with, with our paralegal team, their supervision is somebody else's problem. That's you know, right. They've, they've That's got right. somebody on site whose full-time job it is to be eyes on 
And ultimately, you are you are and we're willing to pay more for that outsourcing sure. service because it gives you the ability to have the kind of lifestyle that you were really looking for when you thought of re-engineering the law firm. Because again, I mean, one of the core things on any outsourcing is the scalability. Yes. If if you want to hire a para, paralegal, that okay, but. If you've got a slow week, you're still paying the same yeah. amount for that paralegal. That's right. That's right. And they're sitting there doing nothing. I mean, there are certain times where some of our virtual assistants don't have a lot to do, but in the end, uh, it catches up with them. But we, we outsource a lot of our stuff in the new businesses, not with the current stuff, but um, or not with the law firm stuff, but the new businesses that I have in terms of teaching all that. It gets outsourced to the Philippines and it's a lot cheaper. And the people that we hire are college educated and they're super bright. So why would I spend 15, 20, $30 an hour here when I can, you know, spend $5 an hour for someone that now really that work at night, them are nights. And, and it doesn't matter to me because as long as the work gets done, that outsourcing is really uh, creating an opportunity for me not to have to do all the minutia. And, and people think it's this zero sum game of, Oh, you're sending the jobs overseas, but it's not that at all. It's freeing up the U S workforce to do things that we're uniquely qualified for. That I, is I can important. Create way a, more value for my firm if I'm not drafting forms, that doesn't help anybody. Well, and, and a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the stuff that you're outsourcing, the people in, in the United States, unfortunately, don't want to do this kind of work. It's very easy to hire someone and they sit there like you're talking about this secretary um, not doing the job and they just, they don't want to do it. But there's a lot of eagerness. And looking for the next better job. That's right. But there's a, so much eagerness on behalf of some of these very bright people all over the world. India, Bangalore, you talked about. Uh, Philippines is one that there is a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of people because there's an American uh, military presence there and there's, everybody speaks English. And so you have college-educated, English-speaking uh, folks that are, are hurting and want work and are like, mm-hmm. Please, I, I can do video. I mean, they can do all kinds of stuff. So, and, and for any of your listeners who are thinking about outsourcing options, um, definitely one of the advantages of the Philippines is that the English is closer to yes. American English. The accent is closer. Right. Um, English is actually the language in which most higher education is taught in India. Right. I spent right. over a year there. Right. Um, but the accent is different. And sure. actually also the, um, the language itself has English anachronisms that are a little bit unusual to American speech. So sometimes the writing comes across as unusual. A little bit. It's just, and you can see it come through a little bit differently, but it's negligible as far as I'm concerned. And and for me, you know, I I have assistants that we will hire here in the United States, but for the most part right now, uh, Philippines is where it's at for us. So let's wrap this interview up. I appreciate your time regardless. This has been amazing to hear Uh, someone that has done what I advocate. And so outsourcing, automating, whatever you can do to work less. Tell me what all of this re-engineering has done for you and your life and the outcome of all the time you spent figuring this out. Uh, Well, it's still a huge amount of work. I don't want to make it sound like I'm sitting on a beach in Thailand, but I'm, I'm now able to sit at a coffee shop in Thailand and, and do my work from there rather than being tied down in in time and place here in the States. And having that mobility is really important to me. Um, You know, just in the last two years, I've been twice to Thailand, um, a month in India, Bhutan, um, and Laos. And I'm heading to uh, Denmark, um, Greenland, and Thailand in the next year. So that's a, a lifestyle that 10 years ago was basically impossible impossible for attorneys yeah. like you'd, you'd be yeah. i think the, the biggest takeaway that i'd like the listeners to get from this interview greg is the fact that this can be done you're doing it others are doing it look i, I haven't worked full time in my firm for five years i was able to write a book and and start teaching and all this stuff by implementing various things now not so much outsourcing but the automation part and setting up the business to run it's on autopilot without me and this is something that when I talk to attorneys about this, they look at me and say, that's not a possibility. I said, yes, it is. This is possible. And it's happening as we speak. And Greg, you are a poster child at this point because you're doing it. So I kudos to you. Let me mention one thing to help. I mean, people think it sounds scammy, right? It sounds scammy. 
things like automation and, and right. things like that. And, you know, getting to go to Asia sounds scammy, but I, I really feel that with the emphasis on treating the firm as a business and looking at systems, we've developed a firm that provides way, way, way better client service than most firms out there. And our results are outstanding. We've, we've yes. literally never lost a, a, a family immigration case here in the States. And so it's not like we're, we're not doing a disservice to anybody. We're no, doing you're not an at all. Standing job. We're just doing no. it in a way that also allows us to spend time with our families. Well, that's the key. And, and when you look at the systems you have in place, and this is exactly what I did with my firm. I, I looked at everything under a microscope and I said, how can we make this not only run better, but do better for our customers, clients, depending on who they are, uh, so that we have raving fans. And so, right. yes, when Net you- promoters. He, that's right. When you hear this idea, it's difficult to wrap your head around as an attorney. But in the end, when you set this up and you have systems of your business that run, uh, it's done in a way that is client focused. It's all about the client. I mean, this is exactly what you've done. So kudos to you, Greg. I appreciate your time today. If, uh, if you are doing what we talked about in terms of the, uh, the outsourcing and stuff, please let me know. And regardless, we're going to put your info down below. If anybody has any kind of immigration that they think Greg might be interested in or his, his firm in taking, uh, soundimmigration.com will put his information in the show notes so that you guys have an ability to connect with his firm and, and uh, use the outsourcing to set an appointment to talk to one of the attorneys if need be. Plug for schedule once. It's great. That's right. No, it's great. I use it too. But thanks again, Greg. We appreciate your time. And uh, we, we want to have you back at some point. We'll continue this conversation maybe with Casey because there's a lot we didn't cover today and there's a lot more that we can talk to you about. So appreciate it. Sounds good. Thanks, Adam. And All right. Have a good week. Too.